very much and thank you for coming here today afternoon I'm, I'm sorry that we couldn't provide lunch but I hope you enjoy the uh, mm -hmm. yeah. the snacks and uh, so the the topic today is the initiative called CPEC which is a part of the broader uh, Chinese global development strategy called Belt and Road Initiative uh, that initiative, in that initiative, the Chinese government made a pledge 
to provide financial and technical support to um, countries in Asia, in Africa, in Middle East that need support in order to develop their uh, infrastructure and primarily infrastructure for trade and transportation. Um, let me just show you a picture of how it all began. The project was announced by uh, President Xi Jinping of China in uh, uh, Kazakhstan, in the Nazarbayev University in 2013. And uh, he chose that country because uh, China is very much interested in Central Asia being a part of this Belt and Road Initiative. One of the benefits of that is that uh, there are large sources of energy in Russia, in, in the Central Asian countries that can be transported into China and many projects are already underway. And also, uh, as those of you who are familiar with the um, history of uh, development, industrial development in China, know that most of the industrial development has taken place in eastern part and coastal areas. But there is a vast area here in western China, the Xinjiang province in particular, which is very large and has a very small population of only 23 million people for an area which is the size of France. And there is a consideration that if industrial trade expands in Central Asia and with Middle East, then part of the industrial activities that are so much concentrated in Eastern China can be moved to Western China. The reason for that is that right now Chinese trade has to go through Indian Ocean, through Malacca Strait, to various parts of the world. So production in Western China will uh, be expensive to transfer to Eastern China. But if these routes are developed, then production here can go through Pakistan, Central Asia, even through Iran, to many destinations. And those goods, in terms of transportation costs, would be cost effective. So that is part of the calculation for the initiative for Belt and Road Initiative. The other motivation that China has for trying to provide support for such a large initiative that will involve many countries is that Chinese um, government has accumulated a large amount of surplus as a result of its trade <coughs> surplus. And the, this surplus is now in the form of significant amounts of savings, most of it in Western assets, in government bonds of the United States. And at the same time, um, they have accumulated a large amount of engineering capacity and construction capacity. Because in the past 40 years, they have been investing heavily in infrastructure inside China. But now many of those projects have been completed, and China is trying to provide opportunities for these um, firms to have activities, but since options inside the country are limited, they are focusing on opportunities abroad. So you have excess surplus money on one hand, excess opportunity for engineering activities and construction on the other hand, and a large number of neighbors that if you can create networks of transportation, you can uh, really utilize all of these resources efficiently and in the long run, creation of these networks will help China sustain its trade and export, uh, particularly manufacturing and industrial export. Also, some of the um, industries that are um, uh, perhaps uh, less efficient in terms of not being high tech and require more energy, uh, energy intensive, particularly fossil fuel industries, can either be moved to Western China or can be moved to countries around China as China moves to higher stages of industrial development and focuses more on uh, high tech, uh, more high added value industries. So these are the roads and the maritime roads of the Belt and Road Initiative. 
Um, there are uh, usually it's identified with six main roads, two of them going here, one here, two down here, one down in uh, Pakistan. This is the one that we're going to focus on. And Pakistan's project is also important because it includes the establishment of a major seaport, commercial seaport, which can be connected to other seaports that China is currently developing as a part of this Belt and Road Initiative. So when did the uh, China-Pakistan initiative began? Uh, the official announcement was in 2015. The idea was developed in 2013. Of course, China-Pakistan relations are very old. They go back to 1950s. Both countries had an incentive to develop a strategic and military alliance uh, because they were both concerned about India. Pakistan and India tension are, are well known, and China and India have also had uh, tension, tensions and rivalry in Asia for a long time. So <coughs> here you see Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, it's President Xi Jinping that is visiting uh, Pakistan and in this visit, formally in this visit, the, the CPEC was formally announced. Um, just before we start, I'd like to show you uh, some comparisons in terms of where Pakistan and China stand in terms of the size of their economies. If you go back to 1980, the per capita income of Pakistan was even larger than China. And these statistics here, as you notice, PPP means that the data has been adjusted to take into account the, the difference in cost of living in these economies so that the comparison is valid. But over time, uh, after China began its uh, major economic reforms, after the death of Mao Tse-Dung, you see that China has taken off and now per capita income of Pakistan is 5,000, but China has reached about 20,000. Even more interesting is uh, the difference between GDP, the size of China and uh, Pakistan economies. And here you can see, again, they started at very similar levels, almost close to $200 per capita, but now uh, $200 billion. But now China has approached $30 billion. Uh, the, if you look at official current currency value of Chinese economy, it's below United States. So it's, I think, about uh, uh, 12 to 13 trillion dollars. But when you adjust for price differences, this is where China stands. And uh, for Pakistan, it, uh, with PPP values, it's almost close to a thousand billion dollars. So you can see the huge gap that exists. When their initial strat strategic alliance began, uh, there was really very much equality between them, and there were most of the cooperation was military cooperation, uh, which still continues, and China is uh, the largest provider of military assets to uh, Pakistan. But after this year, with this wide gap, and given the conditions that I explained about China's desire to invest in other Asian countries, this is where the uh, interest in CPEC began as a major economic initiative. So uh, what are the, let me make sure I don't skip. So as far as Pakistan is concerned, Pakistani economy we just showed is very weak for a country with a 214 million population. Um, they have not been able to significantly develop their infrastructure. Uh, Pakistan, because of its military <coughs> tensions with India, uh, allocates a lot of its resources to military preparedness. So what is left in the government for civilian projects and infrastructure are rather limited. Um, transportation inside the country, again, not well developed. Uh, it has tried to attract foreign investment, but because of political tensions inside the country and instability that the country suffers, and also because of the accusation of, accusations of terrorism and um, 
frequent occasions of terrorist activities, it has not been able to attract much foreign investment from Western countries either, nothing significant. Um, also, given the military and uh, strategic cooperation, uh, when Chinese showed a desire to uh, develop this network, uh, Pakistanis considered that this perhaps if we cooperate and move ahead with CPEC, it will further enhance our um, strategic cooperation. Uh, and to develop those uh, assets, those infrastructure investments, um, Pakistan needs advanced technology. And I'm, I'm going to show you why in a minute. The kind of advanced engineering technology that Western countries are not willing to provide because of the high political and security risks in the country. Um, so the CPEC, the project is a um, multi-year project. It is supposed to be completed by 2030. And it's supposed to accomplish three goals for the three important components that uh, stand out. Um, one of them is that it will facilitate industrial and infrastructure development in Pakistan. The third one, <coughs> the second one, is that it will lead to the development of modern transportation, and not only for Pakistan to trade with the rest of the world, but for Pakistan to be used as a transit for China's trade with, in, with um, Africa and Middle East, and also for Central Asian countries, which are landlocked through their network with China. They can also use Pakistan for transit. This is the end vision. Uh, another important dimension of CPIC is that uh, it includes the a project for development of a uh, very large deep water port in the city of Gwadar in uh, Pakistani coast in the Arabian Sea. Uh, this port um, would be under Chinese control for about 40 years because they have contributed to financing it and they're really funding the massive development projects, but this can also have significant uh, economic benefits for Pakistan as well. So let's take a look at what, what is involved. Uh, as you can see, uh, the plan calls for creation of networks, road, and further down the road, pipelines and railways, which connects the city of Kashgar in Xinjiang, China, brings it into Pakistan, all the way down, one route comes to Karachi, which is currently the main commercial port of Pakistan, but it also connects to the city of Gavada, which is under construction as a seaport. And the project is envisioned to be completed in three phases. Um, phase one focuses on uh, transportation and also several plants, uh, coal plants, hydro plants, and solar plants. These are important for uh, Pakistani economy itself because uh, uh, it has suffered a shortage of electricity uh, in uh, recent years, perhaps in the past as well. Uh, to the point that uh, uh, in many areas, electricity might be available maybe four hours per day, uh, five hours per day, which makes industrial activity and even daily life very inconvenient. Some of these are coal uh, uh, powered uh, uh, power plants. Some of them in the north would be hydro, where there is um, a good rainfall and uh, enough water resources, and of course there is wind and solar. So the um, first phase uh, already has passed with some progress, not everything has been on target. But uh, if you look at uh, the phases two and three, uh, you see that this uh, project is not only concerned with infrastructure, but also some other developments <coughs> that are intended to make Pakistani uh, economy competitive. So obviously energy is one important component, but it goes beyond that to other activities. Uh, and it also includes a number of reforms that Pakistani government itself <coughs> is undertaking in order to 
attract uh, foreign investment. For example, creation of special economic zones and regulations which offer incentives uh, for attraction of investment. These include tax incentives, uh, which are quite attractive uh, and also uh, they include 100% foreign ownership um, opportunities for that. Uh, these, some of them are similar to the incentives that Chinese government itself offered during the various phases of its own industrial development. The, what, what about China? What is China's interest in uh, investing this. The project initially was approximated at about 43 billion, but now more recent estimates say that it would be around 60 billion dollars. <coughs> so for China, um, one of the most important aspects is the location of Pakistan and its position in the Arabian Sea. China is heavily dependent on Persian Gulf oil exporters uh, especially countries like Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Qatar for natural gas and oil. Currently, these are transported through Malacca Sea to eastern China. U.S. military has heavy military presence. In almost most of these countries, U.S. is available. This area, especially the Malacca Sea, is considered a risk region for transport of Chinese goods and energy resources because in case of a tension with the, with the rest, in the, with the United States, this can be uh, blockaded. So if China can develop this route, first of all, it's much shorter, but it is, becomes an efficient path for China to transport energy resources to Western regions and also to transport exports. In addition to that, this Gawadar port itself can become not only a commercial port, but it can provide services to Chinese Navy at some point, if they would like to uh, maintain naval presence in this area. So far, China's primary interest is in areas around it, and uh, China maintains a, a tendency to be to remain neutral. The only external port that they have is a small presence in Djibouti where most uh, major powers maintain a presence. But it seems that if they want to increase their naval presence, this would have a significant strategic value for China, both in terms of uh, geopolitical competitions with the United States and also with India. Okay, but the, why is it so challenging in terms of engineering? Because if you, if you look at here, going from Kashgar to Gawadar, this area is very mountainous. It's part of the Himalayan mountain range. And to show you what is the elevation, first of all, this shows if you start from Kashgar, you have to go up to elevations, and you can see the portion in red is here. You practically, the road and whatever pipeline that you establish, you have to go up to elevations up to 5,000 meters in very mountainous regions. And then gradually come down, but when you go to southern and central part of Pakistan, the route is at low elevation. So this is the major engineering challenge. And China has had a good history of building infrastructure inside China in regions that are very rough terrain and mountains. So they have that experience. So just to give you an example, this is the border crossing between China and Pakistan. And you can see the terrain in the background of what is involved. This picture is from here, Hunjara Pass, right here. OK, a little bit about politics of CPEC. So um, you saw already the picture of Nawaz Sharif he looked much younger and relaxed. This is a more recent picture because he has faced uh, political tensions and uh, problems. But uh, so as a politician, civilian politician, he was the one who initiated the CPEC, signed the contracts. But um, the army in Pakistan is the most important political, strategic, and military institution. 
and the army uh, decided that uh, perhaps he was sort of using CPEC to gain too much power, and the civilian government was gaining too much power in Pakistan. So he was accused of corruption with regard to CPEC contracts, and during the next election, this uh, uh, is now the Imran Khan, the new president of the uh, Pakistan. Prime Minister. New, I'm sorry, Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan. Uh, so the, uh, uh, it seems that army helped him to come to power. Uh, during this transition and in the past two years, there was a little bit of reduction in CPEC activities in 2018-2019, but that seems to have part of it have been, it was a readjustment so that army, which itself has a lot of economic assets, wanted to make sure they are involved in CPEC projects and they would be able to benefit from them. Uh, the civilian prime minister and army are committed to CPEC. And the key factor that can sustain and push CPEC forward, of course, is the army. As long as they are willing to support it uh, because of their um, power in, in Pakistani politics, it is likely to continue. So now I'd like to just focus on uh, one of these projects in detail because it's important for both pa for Pakistan and also for China's strategic uh, ambitions with regard to CPEC. And that is the city of Gawadar. This is the master plan envisioned in CPEC for the city of Gawadar. Here we're talking about an area which is about um, almost 50 kilometers. This is not a small region. And you see the unique shape of this uh, port. This is when it would be developed. Ultimately, there are industrial zones, uh, center just for refineries and petroleum. And there are residential zones and all kinds of activities around it. And of course, this is currently under development by China. This would be the deep sea terminal in this area, which is also calm because of the presence of this barrier. The old city of Gavada is only this corner, so you can see how large the area is going to be <coughs> in comparison to what exists uh, right now at present. This is an aerial view uh, of uh, Gavadar, a very interesting design uh, with, I think, very good potential. It has an, a large area which is flat, and then there are mountain ranges. Because of this desert flat area, some people have compared it to Dubai, because Dubai also had flat land, significant amount of flat land. And presence of this flat land is what makes the potential to develop this into a large seaport and also a large industrial commercial zone associated with that seaport, because there is room to expand. And of course, as part of CPEC project, um, the government is also the Chinese government, is developing the road that goes from here to the coastal highway that goes from here to Karachi, and we saw that in the map. So that there is connectivity to the CPEC road that goes to China. Okay, so one thing that uh, is uh, going on is that as this project is developing in the city of Gawadar, uh, we are uh, receiving information, indirectly, but not much in, in Pakistani media, official, that the Pakistani army and Pakistani navy are acquiring land around it. One of the key questions from international community's point of view has always been that will China use the water or some area near to it to develop a naval base, a Chinese naval base. Both China and Pakistan have denied that there is any such an intention. But this development is interesting because if Pakistani army is developing naval assets and military assets around Gowadar, then given the strategic relations between Pakistan and uh, China, those facilities would be also available to China. So this becomes the strategic dimension of how 
the water's development can affect China's uh, relative power in the Indian Ocean. So, um, what is the evidence for that? The evidence is that there was a there were several reports, but one of them was in the in Herald, one of the publications of Pakistan, in uh, October of 2019, and the reporter traveled around in areas in Gowadar and other areas to the east of Gowadar, speaking with the locals, and found out that uh, Navy was indirectly purchasing uh, land from the farmers in these areas, acquiring land. But they were doing it not openly for two reasons. First of all, they didn't want land speculation to bring up the price and make it expensive. And also, perhaps, they didn't want to attract so much attention that Navy is doing that. The interviews were conducted around here near this lagoon called Kamakor <coughs> Lagoon and around the city of Pasni. Uh, and they, the locals reported that. And one of the uh, intermediaries for this land acquisition, acquisition is this man, Imam Bizendru. He has an international reputation. He has been accused of being involved in drugs, but he is also a very powerful person in the area of Baluchistan. Gawadar is in part of uh, Pakistan called Baluchistan, and I'm going to talk more about that and its significance later. But the report indicates that many farmers, farmers have claimed that he has been instrumental in purchasing land and then reselling it to the Navy. He is a very powerful person in the in the area and uh, has influence in appointing politicians from Baluchistan to the um, Pakistani Parliament. Uh, other reports from the city of Pasni, a beautiful a small city, but I think has a lot of uh, potential, and you can see it's uh, again in proximity of Gabon. Uh, so these land purchases are, are interesting. Now, naval presence in Gawadar and around it, and army presence, uh, so much, much more than uh, navy, uh, is for security reasons. Because the, the region of Baluchistan is a region that is populated by the ethnic Baluchis. Baluchistan has a population of about uh, 12 million out of the country of 206 million. And there has been some uh, resentment, some opposition to the CPEC project in Baluchistan. And there have been a number of attacks on Chinese workers working in Gowadar. With the progress of CPEC projects, uh, approximately 80,000 Chinese engineers and workers are currently active in Pakistan. So there's a large number of them. And the Chinese, the Pakistani army uh, is very concerned about their security. Since they have a large concentration here, the army has increased the, uh, pre its presence. There are many checkpoints around here. And they have checkpoints all around in order to provide security. But that means that they have also uh, uh, created some barriers for freedom of movement of the locals. So some Baluchis express concern that even when they want to go to the water, they face checkpoints and questioning because of that. Nevertheless, the, the army is very present. Of course, presence of Pakistani army in Baluchistan is nothing new. There has been insurgency in that region, and the army and the insurgents have been in uh, confrontation for several decades. So here is an image of a uh, typical soldier in, in guard around her. And you can see the view of the trunk of the water that we showed in the map uh, in that area. Here is another picture uh, of, uh, there. Uh, the, the, uh, the Pakistani Navy also, the Navy ships, are also increasing their presence, providing security for the ships that come to the water. Because gradually, the, the volume of uh, transportation from Gavadar is, sea transportation is increasing. OK, so, um, so that was an overview. But now I'd like to talk a little bit about 
the concerns that have been expressed about this project. Um, Pakistani government is short of money. And they are running large deficits. Uh, currently, the balance of payment is negative, especially balance of trade with China is very negative. Large volume of trade coming from China, about $14 billion in 2018. Pakistani exports about, I think, $1.5 to $2 billion. So there is a white cap. And overall, um, China has been providing and financing many of these projects as loans. So like many other projects related with the uh, Belt and Road Initiatives, there is a criticism about debt trap, the fact that these built up and how is China, Pakistan is going to pay them back. In response to those, there has been a slowdown in recent years in some of the projects. Some of them have been on hold as Pakistan tries to deal with this crisis. The Pakistani government has had two responses. They have gone to IMF to request a financial assistance from IMF, and they have also gone to Arab countries. Traditionally, Pakistan has had good relations with Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, so they have reached out for aid from Arab countries, and they have actually received some aid from them to deal with this issue. The second issue is pollution of some of the energy projects. The coal projects in some parts, uh, obviously coal is not the most efficient um, source of uh, electricity power, and there has been some concern inside Pakistan that these technologies that China is bringing are not the most advanced ones, but these are the older technologies in China that they are transferring into Pakistan. There's also some concern about land acquisition for these power plants that farmers believe that they have not been adequately compensated for the land that has been uh, taken for these power plants. That is part of the uh, overall concern about equity and benefits that CPEC provides, meaning that in some regions, the local people believe that they will not be beneficiaries most obvious part is Baluchistan itself, where uh, there is a lot of construction underway, but the number of Baluchis that have been employed has been limited compared to um, the number that have come from other parts of uh, Pakistan. This is partly because of the fact that there is lack of education, that the locals might not have the skills, they will be primarily farmers or fishermen, and partly because of the connection between domestic Pakistani industries and the Chinese industries that are managing this. Therefore, the employees and experts that are Pakistani come from urban developed parts of Pakistan. There is also ethnic resistance to this because you have an, a separatist movement in Baluchistan, and they believe that with the uh, development of Gwadar as a major port, there would be demographic migration to Gwadar. Currently, it has, I think, about, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, about 180,000, 150,000, but the projection is that Gwadar will grow into a city of half a million. And they say this will lead to, perhaps, demographic shift. The northest uh, area of Pakistan near China called Gilgit Baltistan. That is also a center of many ethnic minorities, various religious minorities, and that is uh, part of the greater Jammu Kashmir region. And their status is still clear. They are uh, not clear. They are an administrative region, but not a province with political presentation. Their worry is that as CPEC develops inside their region, uh, the central government might even put more political domination on them. And they are also worried that the agricultural projects of CPEC in their region uh, will benefit the major agribusinesses in the region rather than the local farmers in, in that province. The same is true also with the province of KPK, which is also very suitable for hydropower and uh, farming. 
So there are all these concepts, but uh, in my opinion, there is so much momentum for this by the army and by the greater political forces in Pakistan that CPEG is likely to move forward uh, rather than being uh, stopped. However, these can have costs for CPEG. Security cost it could be quite significant as it moves along. And also, these uh, bring forward the question of how uh, this CPEC and other Belt and Road projects should be managed to make sure that the locals will benefit and to make sure that the benefits of these Chinese development projects are equitably distributed within a recipient country, within a target country. Okay, so in Baluchistan, what we're talking about is this. Uh, first of all, the Baluchi people spread over three countries. You have the Baluchistan region in Iran, uh, in Pakistan, and in that area, population 12.3, but it accounts for 42% of Pakistan's land area. So very large <coughs> land area, but with a very small population. And uh, variety of uh, uh, resistance. There are Islamic movements there. There are separatist movements that are present in Baluchistan. Uh, so they are very much concerned. If properly managed, this can uh, make a positive impact on Baluchistan's economy. Not only the port itself, but there is a, one of the uh, routes in CPEC will connect the water to Quetta. It will improve, significantly improve the route from these two, and that connectivity, even the future there is peace with Afghanistan, could also provide an opportunity for linking Afghanistan uh, with the water seaport. So uh, if you don't take all of the political challenges into account, uh, there, are, there is a lot of potential, but there is no way that we can ignore those the political factors. In the northern region, again, okay, you have the challenge of uh, the engineering challenge of developing this area. Some parts of this road, uh, in winters, it's not even accessible for several months. So imagine what can be done to secure those roads um, 12 months a year. Uh, there are landslides that uh, disrupt it. And also uh, the contestation, the, the unresolved the Kashmir problem could, could spill over in terms of potential tensions that might arise in that area. Okay, so now let's spend a few minutes on the external dimension of CPEC. Why is it important? Uh, because CPEC can affect the connections between these four players, China, Pakistan, Middle East, and India. India is concerned because uh, uh, the CPEC itself enhances the connections between China and Pakistan. Both of them are uh, India's rival. And also in terms of uh, connection to Central Asia. Uh, India will not be able to benefit from CPEC because of the ongoing tensions with Pakistan, so it has tried to find an alternative route. And for Middle East, of course, uh, the opportunity to send resources to China through an alternative route, other than the sea route that I just showed, is an option. So let's take a look at the position of Gavadar. Um, its military strategic value is quite uh, obvious. Anyone who can maintain a presence here they, they can really have uh, an advantage in terms of uh, a military position throughout Persian Gulf and the Arabian Sea. So th that is the most uh, obvious consequence of uh, Gavadar and Chinese interest in Gavadar. Because of its proximity to Persian Gulf. We know that about two-thirds of world's oil and natural gas resources are concentrated here. And this is likely to run out of oil and gas after every other region if we, were, if we continue to 
use oil and gas resources to, to the last unit of value. Now, Arab countries are showing interest in Gabon. Um, Saudi Arabia has had a long strategic relations with uh, Pakistan. There are unconfirmed reports that Saudis are very much interested in uh, Pakistan's nuclear technology and uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, Pakistanis often provide soldiers to Saudi Arabia and even in um, Yemen or in uh, Bahrain when they have operations, there are Pakistanis that uh, cooperate with them. Um, okay, now, uh, but Saudi Arabia has a lot of resources and investments, and they do invest in Pakistan. They are also interested in Pakistan for religious reasons. They provide a lot of the financial support for religious schools, and they are interested in Pakistan as part of their um, proxy war or animosity with Iran, because Pakistan is to the east of Iran, and Saudis provide funding to groups opposed to Iran that are active in Balochistan. So that's the strategic dimension of why Saudis are interested. In uh, recent years, it's in the past two years, Saudis have shown interest in investing in Gavadar projects, not just because of the benefit of investing for domestic Pakistani market, but because they can then use the water as a, an industrial port for refining oil products and exporting them through pipelines to China and to the rest of China. So they see that potential there. Um, Pakistan is very, very actively seeking Saudi investment uh, because they don't want to be too reliant on China and IMF. But it's not just Saudi Arabia. We see in the past two years that United Arab Emirates and Qatar and Kuwait and many others are also coming and looking at the master plan and even they have started um, signing contracts and investing. <coughs> Another value of Gavadar is that it's a major transshipment for all of the countries around here. Qatar, for example, was relying on, on Dubai for what they call transshipment. Large cargoes would come to Dubai and then they would be um, transferred to a smaller ships for transport to Qatar and many areas because they do not have the deep sea facilities that Dubai has. But now there is tension between Qatar and United Arab Emirates. Well, many of you have read about it. So Qatar is very much interested in Gavadar to be used as a storage and reshipment facility so that they can bring cargo here and from here to Qatar. And Qatar is also a major exporter of natural gas, liquid natural gas. They are interested in establishing facilities here to bring their natural gas here in liquid form and then through pipelines send it to China or even use the storages over there. So this potential that the water has, has raised some speculations that in the future, the water might even compete with Dubai uh, as an alternative to Dubai, uh, because its location is uh, quite a strategic and uh, from economic point of view, even advantage, some might, advantageous, some might uh, argue, uh, because if there is any kind of tension here, there might be disruptions in Dubai but not in Gavada. It's further out into the Arabian Sea. Um, Arab investments, we, can, we have been seeing them in special zones around Gavada. So this is part of the master plan. And you can see that there are large amounts of land allocated for investment projects. Uh, and uh, Arab countries have shown already interest in investing in these. Uh, regions. Especially in oil and gas, there is a region that is dedicated for uh, oil and gas. It's called the uh, Gavadar um, International Petroleum City. And uh, Saudis visited there last year. United Arab Emirates leaders visited. And Saudis have proposed a $10 billion 
refinery, and they are, they are also thinking of a petrochemical plant. UAE, both private and public enterprises of UAE are investing in this one, and also in industrial zone for investments other than oil. The Qataris themselves, for example, are investing in a um, food storage facility development um, for transshipment to Qatar. Another dimension of Gowadar is the uh, India-Iran cooperation. So we said that um, India was concerned about access to Russia and Central Asia, but they couldn't do it through Pakistan. India is also very much interested in having a trade link to Afghanistan, which is landlocked, but not through Pakistan. So for, for almost two decades, India has been negotiating with Iran for development of this port city called Chabahar. But they cannot go forward because Iran is a target of American sanctions. And India's strategic relations with the United States are very important in order to um, sort of contain China, United States' broader strategy in Indian Ocean is to develop closer relations with India, closer military relations. So Indians were, are not interested in upsetting the United States. Therefore, this port has not been developed, despite the fact that Iran has requested frequently for the port to be developed. At the same time, Iran and Pakistan have been negotiating a gas pipeline so that Iran can transport its, its gas to Pakistan. Before the recent tensions with India, the project was to have this pipeline extend through Pakistan to India, and it was called the Peace Pipeline, sort of a dream of peaceful cooperation between these three countries. So Iranians built the pipe, uh, natural gas pipe to the border of Pakistan, and by the way, Iran has one of the largest sources of natural gas uh, next to Qatar in the world. They brought it here, but Pakistanis have not developed their part of the, this pipeline. Why? For two reasons. American pressure on Pakistani government and lack of funding to do that. Therefore, this has not made progress. But now that Gawadar is being developed, it appears that uh, Iran is so frustrated with India that Iranians uh, last year approached Pakistan and China and said, we would like to link to Gawadar. We, we are interested in extending <coughs> a road uh, through uh, Baluchistan to Gawadar. Um, so again, everything with Iran, it depends on how this ongoing massive sanctions against Iran will go forward. But this is a, a development that shows that if, if Iran also links to the water, we're going to see uh, even more significance to the water because not only the Arabs, uh, Saudi Arabia and others are linking to uh, the CPEC, but Iran is also linking the CPEC. That gives more validity to both the water seaport and the transport routes that go through uh, Pakistan. Um, but another factor to take into account in this is that Pakistan is very much opposed to this. And Pakistan is a major funder of Pakistan. Uh, I'm sorry, Saudi Arabia is very much opposed to this project because of its uh, uh, animosity towards Iran. And Pakistan has significant, uh, Saudi Arabia has significant influence on Pakistan. To give you an example of that, just last month there was a major meeting of the Organization of Islamic States in Malaysia. And Pakistan, the country's foundation is by, by definition, the, but because of Islam, that it was created. Pakistan did not go. Why didn't Pakistani pres Prime Minister go to attend this important event? for Islamic countries because the president of Turkey was going there. And Saudi Arabia doesn't like the president of Turkey. And they asked Pakistani government not to go. And Imran Khan said, 
Sure, you are giving us six billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, although there is potential here, uh, it all depends on the pressure of Saudi Arabia, with how much pressure they might accept. Pakistan has not directly got involved in the proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Even when Saudis asked the Pakistani government to send troops to Yemen, they refused because Pakistan itself, its population is about 20% Shiites, and it doesn't want to cause sectarian tension among the Sunnis and Shiites of its own country. The United States is concerned about CPEC. So this lady is um, Ambassador Alice Wells, the Under Secretary for South Asia. And she gave a talk last month, actually in November of 2019. Uh, she visits Pakistan and India frequently. In her talk, she expressed concern about CPEC becoming a dead trap and criticized uh, the way uh, CPEC is managed. And she said that the American model of providing grants and demanding reforms is better than CPEC. Um, but in reality, if we look at the history of Pakistan-US relationships, the aid that, Pakistan, that US provides to Pakistan is primarily military aid. And the economic aid that US provides, again, it is linked to the projects going to American firms. Practically every country that provides aid to a developing country, they have a conditionality that most of the money should be, contracts should be awarded to our own firms and exports of our country because governments want to pro pro promote their own industries. Nevertheless, uh, for a variety of reasons, the United States does have some influence on Pakistan, the Pakistani army. Um, so those might affect the perception of uh, Pakistan towards uh, progress of CPEC. But again, even though it might lead to some modification or a slowdown, I don't think it will lead to a complete suspension. China is too important for Pakistan to, to abandon. And of course, in response to this, um, the Chinese ambassador in Pakistan issued a, a statement saying that these accusations are not true. We are truly trying to make sure CPEC benefits Pakistan and the benefits in terms of growth and jobs are going to be realized in later phases when actually Pakistani industries begin to grow. Okay, so where does, I'm going to wrap up because I want to give you a chance to ask questions. Where does this uh, go to CPEC? I believe there is enough momentum for it to continue. And I think Arab countries are going to become second partners in CPEC after China. So among various countries that might show interest, we might see significant uh, interest from Arab countries already. They are, they are involved. Um, risk factors, domestic resistance, concern about corruption, and of course, political instability. You can never rule those out in, in Pakistan. Um, if China and Pakistani government want to make sure this project is successful, it is really very important to address the uh, concerns and grievances of uh, local people in, people in various provinces, and also make sure the benefits are fairly distributed. This is a major concern about Belt and Road initiatives. And those of you who are interested uh, in progress of Belt and Road Initiative worldwide, World Bank report, uh, issued a very detailed report last year, which is available. Uh, and uh, again, they also show that in many countries, uh, the question of equity in terms of distribution of benefits is a uh, major concern. Um, fighting corruption is a major requirement. Already, in my opinion, if you look at what is happening in Pakistani politics, CPEC has become a motivator for some of the initiatives to 
confront corruption. Whether they are successful or not, we're going to see, but um, I think there would be enough incentive by the army and by some stakeholders to confront the corruption that might really disrupt or make the projects ineffective. Um, in my opinion, China itself should revisit its policy of neutrality, complete neutrality. Chinese policy is that we deal with governments and we, do not, we never interfere in domestic politics of any country. But uh, when you invest so much in a country, I think you need to introduce some conditionality. So Western countries and United States emphasizes democracy and human rights, uh, China's government might not want to emphasize those, but perhaps China's government can emphasize basic human rights and say, if you are going to receive these uh, loans and our assistance, you must focus on poverty reduction and corruption reduction. Uh, making that conditionality makes the project more successful and more acceptable to the local population. So I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs> if there are any questions or comments, I'll be happy to take them. Yes. Thank you for the lecture. It's really interesting. I have two questions. Yes. The first question is, what do you think about like, the about the road initiative? Is it a geopolitical project rather than an economic project? Because, you know, uh, when the China made uh, investment, the old countries where she made investment, it's like the whole probability that this investment and credit is going to be returned, as it happened with Sri Lanka case, and it's happening with Belarus and East yes. Europe. Uh, it's like when they, uh, kind of a debt trap diplomacy. So in my opinion, I think like it's a geopolitical rather than economic. The second one, as you were talking about what India wants to do as alternatives, uh, in the, uh, after, like the, in 2015, when the China made a huge investment in the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, then India um, like associated the uh, Asia Asia Africa Growth Corridor yes. with the Japan. Yeah, so it's like the alternative to the PRE project mm -hmm. that will go the sea uh, corridor that goes from Africa with the Do you see about the yes. perspective? Of sure. Sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> With regard to the first one, the first one obviously, um, if you have economic influence, you will also have some political influence. There is no doubt about that. Um, we have seen, for example, the Filipino government practically leaving the American orbit and coming closer to China. So I would say BRI would have both two effects. It would have uh, enhanced China's political influence around the world in international discussions or uh, in the United Nations, more of these countries are likely to support China's, China's position. Uh, and also with regard to economics, there would be more dependence or more interactions with China. They're both valid, so you can't deny them. But uh, in international interactions, I think all major powers do that economic and political influence are linked. You provide aid or trade in order to gain influence as well. So China is a country with self-interest. No one should doubt that. And they don't claim this is aid. They say this is trade. Their argument, their, their motto is win-win, correct? So it's, it's not like one side wins or we are benevolent. Let's find win-win solutions. That's the perception. With regard to India, I'm not uh, very familiar with that project, but my feeling is that um, Belt and Road is going to dominate, and there, any alternative packages would be redundant. And uh, even the relations between India and China, uh, they might improve in the future. There is a lot of initiative by Chinese government. Uh, there are even visits at very high level in order to address some of the differences. So they would be economic rivals. But that rivalry might continue within just Belt and Road framework. What is Belt and Road? 
It's a series of networks of transportation and facilities for trade, but it is not free trade agreement among any two countries. So if you have access to those roads, you can use them to send products to any country that's connected to those roads. So uh, I, I don't know if uh, the Indian alternative would make much progress, especially since even Europeans are now showing interest in Belt and Road, and they are facilitating the, the transportation. It is now possible to take a train from Shanghai and go all the way to Hamburg in Germany. So this connectivity is already available. Uh, so let's let's go from one here and then we'll go to you. Yes. Okay, well, thank you very much for the wonderful sure. presentation. Uh, this is really a subject of interest right now in the economy of the world. And my question is really from somebody coming from what the countries that are called developing countries or poor countries. And when we look at some of the critics about China, uh, sometimes I, f I tend to think that today uh, these critics are more because like the, the time that Europe or the West was controlling the world, there was no counter power to speak about what was happening. Coming from Congo where uh, Belgium, they did things in, in Congo that you've never had a chance yes. to see like on, uh, on, on some of the media. Like uh, we had, uh, the other time we, we were in, in a debate about why is it that the world has spoken about millions of uh, Jews that are being, were killed by the Nazi, hmm. but nobody has ever spoken about the millions of Congolese who died because of the King Leopold II from, yes. from Belgium. So it's in the same way that sometimes I look at whatever is happening with China, and I feel like it's more about the West mm -hmm. that is uh, doing all this propaganda because some things also were, were happening with the development that was done in the West, mm -hmm. in Africa and other developing countries, but there was no really a, a court of power like, to, to speak about that. To speak about that. Yeah, yes. so that is why I come to the fact like about the debt. Yes. African countries right now are indebted. And they are not just indebted to, to, China. to China, they're also indebted to the World Europe. Bank. And so yes. it's in that line that mm -hmm. I feel like, okay, China, it, it, like I always say, it always depends with which media you are listening to. Yes. Like the West controls the, the, the media, they control like all the publishing houses and stuff. It's so easy to listen and to, to get whatever it, it's coming from, from that. Mm -hmm. So of course China, they just found a way of doing it. Of course people are dying for environmental issues and stuff. But I feel sometimes like it may also be like, as he said, it's more uh, geopolitical. Mm -hmm. yeah, so everybody's trying to position themselves. Because they, 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 what I just realized when you, uh, I was actually thinking of asking the question of what about India, uh, the, 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 the cooperation between India and China. Because mm -hmm. when we go into the AIIB, Yes. I see that India is one of the major stakeholders in that. Need. So as I said, there is cooperation. Yeah, so then okay. it feels as if yes. it, it, it may be confusing because India and Pakistan, there, there's an issue, but then India and China, they are playing, uh, like they are yes. also working in some other projects. So like I really okay. feel like it's, so, all right. I don't know if it's <laughs> that way. So you have, uh, um, first of all, um, th this is no secret that the United States is concerned about China as a rising power, as a competitor, the, because Russia is no longer the alternative superpower, it is China. Therefore, the, some of the concerns and some of the publications about Belt and Road look at U.S. interest and what is happening if there is a shift of economic linkage to China, which would be at the expense of the United States. So that's one aspect of it. And it's not hidden. It is published by many organizations, think tanks in the United States, from American point of view. 
but in part of that, in order to sort of uh, reduce the desirability of Belt and Road for some developing countries, they also point out to some of the weaknesses. Now, some of the concerns about the consequences that are listed in Pakistan, they are not motivated by looking at American perspective, but just from domestic Pakistani point of view. In many African uh, Belt and Road projects in Africa, for example, it is the locals who complain that they are not getting enough jobs, but Chinese goods are flooding our markets. So that is a reality that's felt at the local level. So you have to differentiate criticisms that are originated in American self-interest and criticisms in these countries. But uh, legitimate criticism deserves to be analyzed. And I think Chinese themselves should be very alert about the image and the progress. Because if this is not proven beneficial within five or six years, then many people will question the, the value of it. Yes. Now, let's go over here. There was a question here first. Yes. And then, uh, come, and then you. Yes. Why do you see what is going on, as Chris said, about the Chinese and American fighting over different interests, economic or strategy? Yes. Can we say that we are in a, we are in the beginning of a new Cold War, or it's just an economic war? Well, that's, uh, that's beyond my expertise, but <laughs> if you want a non-expert opinion, um, we are in a Cold War, uh, in a sense. Uh, there is certainly a technological war, uh, tech, uh, high-tech competition, no doubt about it. Uh, in Africa and in Latin America, there is a competition between uh, United States and China for access to resources, for access to markets, and also with European Union and European countries, but more uh, directly China and uh, the United States. So no doubt about that. But non-expert opinion. Let's go to you. Yes, it's just. Yeah, it's a wonderful presentation. And uh, sure. especially when we talk about the border. So why China is uh, projecting this project in Gwadar and it's why it's main concern in Gwadar because Gwadar is available uh, at, uh, in the uh, Strait of Malacca is there which is the busiest uh, or you may say busiest trade route and from this strait China can 80% export import its oil from the Middle East Middle Eastern countries and it can easily get access to Europe and uh, Africa. Yes. And Correct. one question, one is that, and secondly, that uh, why Baloch have insurgent there? Because uh, it is not first experience uh, the local Baloch are facing that China is not sincere with the local people. Yes. So there are other projects. Since 1990s, China is investing inside Balochistan and exploiting the natural resources of Balochistan. And Balochistan is known to be a natural, uh, yes. full of natural resources, like the Sender project, which is started right. in 1990. But what has China, although the agreement was done between uh, with the Canadian government, but China uh, was, uh, was uh, you may say, successful to get that uh, yes. project in Balochistan. People, uh, their social corporate responsibilities were the main elements of this project. But local people, they were not hired. When they saw that local people are, uh, there is uprising, then they started diverting their mind by, you may say, uh, religious campaign, uh, by the state that uh, started sending religious preacher people to divert their mind from the actual concern that not getting job or not being yes. employed. I see. Yes. yes, also thank you for mentioning the natural resources in Baluchistan. I didn't mention that, so, but yes, that, that could be also a potential attraction as you develop the industrial zone. As I said, if, um, 
if this project does not take into account the interest of the locals in every area, especially ethnic groups around each of the major activities, uh, it might face uh, difficulties. Uh, it might face resistance, and uh, that needs to be addressed. I promised everyone 1.15. Um, uh, one last question, two minutes, and then we'll, uh, we'll end it. I just want to make sure people don't fear that this is going to go on till uh, 2 o'clock. <laughs> Last question. Go ahead. Well, um, partly, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Sure. You just added to what you have said, because I've seen that clear example in Africa, where I'm a speaker about this in Africa, or the president of this in Africa, and the nation of the African nations were most submissive to China. They didn't do those on guns. Yes. So the infrastructure development, <coughs> but in turn, it's more about the blood and the people production in Africa, as well as the peace with stuff. Yes. In Africa. Okay. So with the second one, can you not see that one as a way of where the president is going to be political as well? Where are the president and governments who are so busy for China because of the following agenda down there? Um, they would come under Chinese influence. Yeah. Uh, to, to give you an example, um, there was a, an initiative in uh, European Union uh, to condemn China for certain human rights violations, but Greece refused to join uh, because uh, China is investing in a Greek port. Uh, in that sense, in international um, uh, discussions or debates, yes. But that is not limited to China. Um, United States also expects countries that receive U.S. aid or are, are under U.S. influence to cooperate in votes on international issues. For example, when it comes to a vote on Palestinian issue, the U.S. calls on countries that receive aid or are considered close allies to support its, um, its position. That, that is not an unusual thing. And as I said, uh, <coughs> the project is not necessarily a benevolent aid project. This is a major initiative that China is funding. So they expect a certain amount of uh, cooperation. Uh, but if other countries in response to China, offer their own initiatives so that developing countries have more um, alternatives and more competition opportunities, then that would be uh, neutralized. But the problem is other countries are not willing to spend money like China in these projects. All over Africa, there are opportunities, but European and American companies consider it high risk. Pakistan is considered high risk, but China is willing. China has approached Iraq and Syria. Uh, I don't think many Western companies are willing to go and help in Iraq and Syria at present. But China has said, yes, we are ready to assist. China is willing to help Afghanistan. So it's, it's a difference in risk tolerance that uh, defines what is different about China. Anyways, thank you so much. Um, you're welcome. Thank you. Some of you are in my class and I enjoyed having you. So we'll meet you for our...